So today we're continuing our series on encounters with God. You'll recall we've already thought about Noah and the rainbow, Sarah and the promise, Jacob and the wrestler and Moses and the fire. One of the threads that's running throughout all of these encounters is that God works really hard at having a relationship with us. God, being God, could easily achieve his aims without starting these encounters with people. People are messy, we make a mess of things, we get things wrong, and yet God chooses to work with us, to work in us, to work through us. He chooses to engage with us, to have these encounters with us, rather than get on with it in his own perfect way without us getting in, in the way. And this is wonderful. It's proof that almighty creator God wants to have a relationship with me and with you. He chooses to work with us, in us and through us because he wants to spend time with us. He wants us to get to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him, the living God. This is what he made us for, for relationship. And so in every encounter, that's what he's working towards. We've also learned that God binds himself to us, makes promises to us and that he always keeps his promises. We've learned that God's power and purposes are not limited by our belief, that just because we don't believe he can do something, that won't stop him doing it. We've discovered it's okay to wrestle with God, to struggle to understand sometimes, to struggle with our faith sometimes, and that he chooses to wrestle with us to help us through it. His purposes are for us to grow and learn and change and be more like Jesus, more like he made us to be. But ultimately, we have free will, we have choice, and we can choose to remain as we are, to go our own way rather than his. We have learned that almighty, powerful God doesn't just show up in our lives when we notice him. By the time we notice him, he's often been at work preparing and guiding us for some time. We learn that this God, who has a purpose for each one of us, doesn't send us out alone to try and achieve those purposes, but that he goes with us. And today we see God as he goes with his people, the Israelites, as they flee Egypt. God goes ahead of them as a pillar or a column of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. You may know the story well. After the whole burning bush incident, Moses goes to Pharaoh and demands freedom for the Israelite saves. Pharaoh says no, and God sends 12 plagues. And after each plague, Moses goes back to Pharaoh and asks that the people be set free. The final plague is the death of the firstborn sons in Egypt. The Israelites are instructed to prepare a special meal of lamb and paint their doorposts with its blood so that the angel of death passes over them. And this time, with this final plague, Pharaoh relents and tells Moses to take the people and go. So they leave Egypt. But they have to go swiftly and they have to go safely. Swiftly because it won't take long before Pharaoh changes his mind and wants his workforce back. Safely because the route out of Egypt was fraught with potential danger. The quickest way from Egypt to the promised land where God was leading his people went northeast up to the Mediterranean coast and then east, skirting along the north of the desert and up into the land that God had prepared for them. Unfortunately, this route was populated by hostile nations, often at war with each other. And in verse 18 of Exodus 13, we hear God's decision making. If they take that direct route, they will expose themselves to the dangers of war and they may choose to return to slavery rather than be slaughtered. So God leads them not on the quickest route, not on the most direct route northeast, but rather southeast out of Egypt. Then they would skirt the south of the desert and come almost due north into the promised land. This route took them via the mountain where Moses had seen the burning bush and where God would give them the law. This, I think, uh, is an experience that chimes with lots of us. God takes us not by the most direct route. And sometimes we don't know why. It might be for our safety. It might be because he has something to teach us. We take the long route around following him 
and we come out differently at the end. So to keep them safe and to lead them the way that he wants them to go, which will involve crossing the Red Sea rather than along the most obvious route, God himself comes. The people encounter God as these pillars of cloud and fire, their day and night leading them on. Now, you might wonder what sort of encounter with God this is. Those pillars, they might be more like the rainbow in the story of Noah, part of the scenery, an important part of the scenery, yes, but part of the scenery rather than a character. You might be thinking that that's what these pillars of fire and cloud are like in this story. God causes them to be there, but God is not in them. They're not really an encounter with God. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that, but if you did think that, you'd be wrong. Here's why. Two main reasons. First and foremost, the Bible tells us that God didn't send the pi pillars of fire and cloud, rather that God was in them. And secondly, they do a lot more than just bob along in front of God's people showing the way. When the Egyptians come to pursue God's people to try and re-enslave them, the column of cloud and fire move. They go from being in front of the Israelites to behind the Israelites. They block the way between the Israelites and the pursuing Egyptians. They form a barrier between the two nations, protecting one from the other. The cloud also, it would come and it would settle upon the mountain where Moses went to receive the law. Once the tent of meeting has been built and erected, the cloud, God's presence, will come and rest upon it. Moses and Joshua would go and hear from God there. And when it was time to leave, the cloud, the fire, would lift up and go ahead. And once it had lifted off the tent, everyone knew this is time to go. These pillars, these columns, they weren't just part of the backdrop. They were visible signs of God's presence with his people, leading them forwards, guiding and protecting them. And the Bible is full of stories of God guiding people. At various times, he uses a donkey, a whale, a bunch of outcasts with a horrible skin disease, prophets, priests, huge hands writing on the wall, blinding lights, dreams and visions, and Jesus, God incarnate himself to come and guide people. He uses these things to show them where to go and what to do next, and that's not even the full list. Sometimes the people listen to God and things tend to work out okay. Sometimes they ignore his guidance and things go awry. But he never stops guiding, leading, protecting his people. And we're told, aren't we, to trust in the Lord with all our hearts, not to lean on our own understanding, but to submit to him and he will make our path straight. A straight path, that seems to me like the way forward will become clear, but often I find it is not. I've struggled this week to write this sermon. It's partly why I asked you all for videos of times God has guided you. I figured that if everyone who uh, listens to this sends me a video of how God's guided them, I could just stitch them all together and I wouldn't need to pre preach a sermon. It'd be wonderful if we could just hear from each other and be encouraged. I didn't get quite that many videos, and so I've struggled. I've wrestled with it. Earlier this week, I was lying in bed. I was telling Vicky I was struggling. And I said to her then, why, why can't I have a pillar of cloud or fire showing me the way? Why, when I'm seeking God's guidance, do I not get a blinding light from the way to Damascus or a talking animal? Why can't God guide us today as clearly as it was for those Israelites. And maybe you've felt the same from time to time. You know in your head that God guides us, that he protects us and cares for us, but sometimes it's hard to see. Sometimes we just want a pillar of fire to make the way forwards clear. But God only came in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud once to lead the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. When he came again to his people, when they needed guidance or protection in the future, it wasn't in the same way. Can you imagine being an Israelite slave in Egypt? It's all you've known. It's all your grandparents, your great grandparents have ever known. And now you're told suddenly that you have to leave. You have to pack up everything you've got. You've never been more than a few miles in your life, but now you are to cross a desert to an unknown promised land. 
You've never had to make decisions for yourself, not important ones, because your life has been dictated to you. And now suddenly you're an autonomous people. You have to take everything with you. You know the journey's going to be hard. You know it's going to be long. And you have to take the smallest baby and the oldest of your people with you too. Those who are fit and healthy and those who are not. I wonder how you feel. The journey that the Israelites had to go on was so hard. The way ahead was going to be so difficult that I think what they needed was a big old obvious sign that God was with them. They needed to know without a shadow of a doubt that it was God leading the way, that God was there protecting them. Without something big and obvious, I think they probably would have chosen to stay at home, afraid of the task ahead, afraid of that journey into the unknown. And in the New Testament, Paul, who was Saul persecuting God's people, he needed something different. He didn't need a comforting guide that would be with him for years wherever he went, showing him the way forwards. He needed a short, short, sharp shock to make him stop what he was doing and go a different way. And so Paul gets a blinding light. God caters to us as we need. You know, I love the NHS. By and large, I think it's a wonderful thing. But one of the problems I think it has now um, is that too often patients become problems. You go to the GP and every time I go to the GP, I see a different doctor. And so they don't know me and they're under so much pressure. They haven't got time to get to know me. It's what's the problem? How can we deal with it? And then on to the next one. And if there was more time for doctors to get to know the patients a bit better... I think it might be easier for them to help us. They might be able to link today's problem with the one we had last year or a similar problem that they know someone else in our family has. They would be able to individualise the problem and therefore the treatment that would be catered to the situation. Now, I know why it's not like that. There's a lot more pressure. They have to uh, see a lot more patients. I understand it would cost a lot more. It's not really practical to do it like that. But I guess the point I'm making is that God does know us well. God knows us so well. He knows our circumstances. He knows exactly what sort of guidance we need. And so Vera gets a nagging feeling that she should make a phone call. Pat gets a preacher uh, in a sermon. Chris gets a happy colleague. Sarah gets a message through studying the Alpha, Alpha course. Pam gets a survey asking her how and where she might be able to serve. The reason I don't get a giant pillar of fire is because what I need is not an obvious sign of God's presence through a horrific trial. I'm not going through a horrific trial and I know that God is with me already. What I often need is a, a small voice, a gentle nudge that doesn't just point me in the right direction, but forces me to come closer to God. That forces me to draw near to him so that I can hear his voice better. Forces me to come and pray and seek him and read his word and engage in that relationship he wants. When we are far away, when we do not know him well or when we are suffering, God might need to shout. But as we get closer, he can whisper, drawing us ever nearer to him. And the idea, I think, is that we get better at hearing, hearing his voice, that we get better at uh, seeing his guidance, at tuning in to him. And even then, sometimes it's only with hindsight that we see his hand at work. I've loved listening to these stories this week of how God has guided some of you. And I wonder how often we knew that it was God's guidance as it happened. How often we only really see him in it as we look back, his hand beckoning us on, shepherding us through, protecting us on the journey. This is one of the reasons why I think we should share regularly with each other, often and clearly, what God is doing in our lives. Because the more often we hear other people say, and God showed me this, 
or and God said this to me through my Bible reading today or God has blessed me with this or God led me to bump into so and so this week. The more often we hear other people acknowledge God's presence in their lives, the better we are able to tune into his presence in ours. We hear them say it and we think, oh, maybe that coincidence that happened yesterday was God at work. Maybe that thing that lifted me up or taught me that lesson was God at work. And so as God's people, I think we need to work hard at sharing God's stories with one another. The ways big and small that we've encountered God each day, each week, each month. Because in this way, we might better be able to see him at work in our own lives. It might mean that we don't need a pillar of fire to know that God is with us. A pillar of cloud leading us on. So here's my conclusions from God's encounter with the Israelites. Our God guides us. Our God protects us. And our God offers us a tailored personal service. Because our encounters with God are all about us having a dynamic living relationship with him. So he guides us and protects us as we need today. Not in the way someone else needed it thousands of years ago. God guides and protects you because he loves you and because he knows you. And he does it in a way that draws you closer to him and into more loving relationships with others. What a good God we have. Go away today, share those God stories with others. And may you be blessed through hearing one another's stories too.